We're in Genesis chapter 32 tonight. Genesis and chapter 32. It's not a very long chapter, so we'll read it all. And we're going to deal with it all tonight, Lord willing. Genesis chapter 32 and verse 1. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall ye speak unto my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban, and stayed there until now. And I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants. And I have sent to tell my Lord that I, might, that I may find grace in thy sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee and four hundred men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him, and the flocks and herds and the camels into two bands, and said, If Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which saidst unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. And thou saidst, I will surely do thee good, and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. And he lodged there that same night, and took of that which came to his hand, a present for Esau his brother, two hundred she-goats and twenty he-goats, two hundred ewes and twenty rams, thirty milch camels with their colts, forty kine and ten bulls, twenty she-asses and ten foals. And he delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by themselves, and said unto his servants, Pass over before me, and put a space betwixt drove and drove. And he commanded the foremost, saying, When Esau my brother meeteth thee, and asketh thee, saying, Whose art thou, and whither goest thou, and whose are these before thee? Then thou shalt say, They be thy servant Jacob's. It is a present sent unto my lord Esau, and behold, also he is behind us. And so commanded he the second, and the third, and all that followed the droves, saying, On this manner shall ye speak unto Esau when ye find him. And say ye moreover, Behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goeth before me, and afterward I will see his face, but adventure he will accept of me. So went the present over before him, and himself lodged that night in the company. And he rose up that night, and took his two wives, and his two women servants, and his eleven sons, and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them, and sent them over the brook, and sent over that he had. But Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall call no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Peniel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh, unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh, in the sinew that shrank. I haven't put a title over tonight's thoughts, but never mind. Uh, the passage divides into four. I don't know whether you've got them in your Bibles, but paragraph markers will very often show you the different subjects. So there's one in my Bible, one at verse 9, another at verse 13, another at verse 24. So you've got three paragraph markers dividing the chapter up into four 
sections and the first one I would say Jacob addresses Esau and in the second section verses 9 through 12 Jacob addresses the Lord and then in verses 13 down to 23 Jacob addresses Esau again and in 24 to the end Jacob addresses the Lord again so Jacob addresses Esau Jacob addresses the Lord Jacob addresses Esau again and Jacob addresses the Lord again so we'll take those four sections one at a time the first of all then is Jacob's first address to Esau now Jacob seems to go doesn't he from the frying pan into the fire uh, Laban with his threats has left him and gone back to Syria paid an Aram but now Esau is coming and uh, I'd like you to have a look at Amos just one verse in Amos I'll give you a few extra minutes to find it because it's one of those it's in the minor prophets you've got Daniel Hosea Joel and then Amos chapter 5 and it really seems to describe uh, Jacob's situation Amos chapter 5 verse 19 the first half of verse says as if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him now Matthew Henry says here we may be in the way of duty and yet meet trouble and uh, I've said this I know several times you know that sometimes trials come and you wonder if you're where you should be but you can be where you should be and still meet with trouble and so uh, Matthew Henry says we may yet be in the way of, we may be in the way of duty and yet meet with trouble God wonderfully brought the children of Israel out of Egypt uh, but then they find themselves with the Red Sea in front and the Pharaoh and his armies behind them there's no question that God had brought them out there's no question that God had worked great miracles for them and that they were in the will of the Lord as they came out with Moses they come to the Red Sea and the next thing they know Pharaoh is coming after them with his army and they're between as they say in the States between a rock and a hard place and you, they might have wondered as they did later on of course in their wilderness journeys whether the Lord had brought them there but of course he had now we read in verse 1 uh, that Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him uh, one, commentator say, one commentator says that the angels appeared only in times of imminent danger and God's hosts become visible, became visible to allay the fear of man's hosts you remember when uh, the Syrians came out to get, uh, to get Elisha and the servant was afraid and uh, Elisha said Lord open the young man's eyes and, and the servant saw all the uh, angels around the mountains all safeguarding Elisha you remember in Matthew chapter 2 um, when uh, the decree goes forth that all the world should be taxed um, in fact it's, it's after that I think before he comes back before Joseph comes back the angel appears to Joseph and warns him in a dream about Herod so if the commentator Andrew Fuller is correct then Esau is coming with some hostility here now Jacob called the place as well we read in verse 2 the name of that place Mahanaim which means two hosts or two camps now that might be a reference to the angels before and behind as some suppose or it might be the reference to the angels as one camp and Jacob's entourage, entourage as another Mahanaim was about 15 to 20 miles east of Jordan in what would later belong to the tribe of Gad and about 80 miles north of Edom which was Esau's northern border because Esau the Bible tells us is Edom so the land of Edom was Esau's country and uh, Mahanaim was about 80 miles north of Esau's northern border but clearly Esau was already on his way now in this first um, address to Esau he sends a message uh, just a message is all he sends that he is now rich maybe to uh, to put Esau at his ease he's not planning to con him out of anything now he's got wealth of his own but then we read that the messenger returned uh, in verse 6 and said we came to thy brother Esau and also he cometh to meet thee and 400 men with him now we can only speculate why Esau came with so many men um, he might have thought perhaps that Jacob himself was coming with an army uh, he might have intended harm to, to, to Jacob 
Or maybe by now he was such a great man that it was common for him to travel with, with so many guards and, and people about him. But Jacob clearly gets the impression that Esau is coming in anger, so there's probably more to the servant's message than, than we read here, because in verse 7, then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. So one gets the impression that the message from those that had, that had come back was Esau was coming with some hostility. Matthew Henry says, angry men have good memories. <coughs> now, I don't think I'm an angry man. Gene keeps telling me these days that I'm a miserable man or something of that nature. But I don't think I'm an angry man. I hope I'm not a miser miserable man, but Gene perhaps thinks otherwise. Um, but I don't think I'm an angry man. God knows whether I am or not. But I had a so-called friend when I was about 10. Dave was his name. I won't give his surname because this might go on the internet. Not that he's going to listen to it, I don't suppose. But Dave was his name. I was about 10. He was a proper little two-faced stinker is what he was. I thought he was my friend, he turned out one of the two, most two, and this has been 55 years ago, and I'd like to tell him to his face, even now, what a stinker he was. Um, I've never forgotten what a stinker he was in all these 55 years. I just say I'd love to tell him, but I don't suppose I'll ever get the chance. Maybe if I saw him after all these years, you know how it is, you, you might not feel so angry, but as I say, I'd still like to tell him. Um, so first of all then, we see... Jacob's first address to Esau. Now we next have in verses 9 through 12 Jacob's first address to the Lord, his first prayer. And it's fear, I think, that drives Jacob to prayer. And that teaches us that adversity can be beneficial. You know, if things went smoothly all the time, we'd probably play a little less than we do. If everything was always honky dory, we probably wouldn't pray so much if we do pray much but we might not pray as much as we do and I would hazard we probably wouldn't and that would you know not do our spiritual lives any good now fear of course might be overindulged which would be sinful but if it teaches us to pray it's bringing us into fellowship with God and the first prayer of Jacob in this chapter reveals to me at least how much he has matured spiritually in 20 years it begins O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac Isaac so he begins his prayer by pleading his privileged relationship you know he mentions Abraham he mentions Isaac his father and his grandfather uh, to whom the Lord had made great promises so he begins by pleading this privileged relationship and, and where Jacob beseeches Abraham and Isaac we beseech the Lord through Christ it's Christ we claim uh, it's the name of Jesus we plead and uh, God will hear that we may not approach the throne of God in the least upon our own merits but we may certainly come with great boldness in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we don't just use that phrase in the name of the Lord Jesus or at least we shouldn't tuck in it onto the end of our prayers like a kind of a magical formula we, we need to understand that Jesus Christ is our only approach to God but he is as it were we can come boldly in the name of Jesus we can come boldly to the throne of God, grace because of the Son of God the Lord Jesus Christ because of what he's done for us what he means to the Father so we should pray whether we use the formula or not we should be conscious that we're approaching God and we have the privilege of approaching God uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ if we're praying in the name as it were of all that God loves we have much more hope of a favorable answer verse 10 he goes on I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant And so again, as we ought to do, Jacob now approaches with humility. I remember reading, you know, years and years ago, when I first got saved, I went to a Pentecostal church, which is where Gene and I met. And uh, some, some of the folks there, not all of them, but some of them seemed to have some funny ideas about prayer. And I remember some of the, I remember, I think it was Abraham reading about him, with what great humility he came before the Lord. With what humility here, Jacob becomes, comes before the Lord. And I thought to myself way back then as a young Christian, there's not enough reverence too often in the way people approach the Lord these days. Do you remember what the Lord Jesus said about two men praying? Luke chapter 18. 
Luke chapter 18. We're just thinking about Jacob's humility in his prayers here. Luke, Luke's Gospel chapter 18. Verse 9, was I saying the black country, nine. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Did you notice that? <laughs> he prayed with himself. God wasn't listening. He prayed with himself. God, I thank thee. That I am not as other men as, as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, says the Lord Jesus, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. It seems to me that after some folks have been saved a few years, they start to pray like the Pharisee. So often in prayer meetings, you know, I hear folk talking about what they used to be like, as though they're not conscious of any sinfulness at the present time, when they ought to be more conscious of that than ever they were before. As new believers, they knew nothing and were humble and teachable. But after a few years of Bible reading and teaching, they know it all. And no one can teach them anymore. And I've seen this happen to young men. Don't let it happen to you. As I pray, God, it won't happen to me. One of, the, one of the great wonders of the world, it seems to me, is a man who's known the Lord or a woman who's known the Lord for 50 and 60 years and is still teachable and still has not got this idea that they know it all and they can't learn anything and they've heard it all before. So having reminded the Lord then of his covenant here and confessed his personal unworthiness, he presents his, he presents his request in verse 11. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him. And then in verse 12, he further consoles and encourages himself with God's promise. And thou saidst, I will surely do thee good, and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So here, as I say, he's further consoling himself and encouraging himself with God's promise, which he had received 20 years before at Bethel. Matthew Henry says, the best we can say to God in prayer is what he has said to us. John Trapp says, promises must be prayed over. So he says here, he remembers what God said, I will surely do thee good. John Trapp again says the promise was so sweet to the patriarch that he repeats it and ruminates it, rolling it as sugar in his mouth and hiding it under his tongue, unquote. Now this was a prophetic promise as well. God had said what he would do for Jacob in the future. So there's something prophetic here. And such promises would be of great comfort, of course. You know, obviously Esau's coming and Jacob's afraid, but he remembers that God has promised that, that he would bless his seed and that it would be as the sand of the sea, which couldn't be numbered for multitude. A better understanding, I think, of prophetic truth among believers would save us from much anxiety about the future too. Prophetic speculations on the internet are plenty as raspberries, but most of it's in imaginative guesswork out of the book of the Revelation. There's a lot of weird and wonderful stuff if you go on YouTube and, you know, and somebody's professing to expand on the book of Revelation, you could wind up anywhere. Um, there's an awful lot of weird stuff on there. Uh, personally, I believe, for example, that the global warming scare is a scam. And I'm not the only one here, I'm sure Derek's nodding, I thought he might be. It's a scam. Um, however, the days may not be far away when the global warming will be far hotter than even the most extreme warm monger imagines. Have a look at Revelation 16 for a moment. So if you're tempted to say global warming will never happen, have a look at Revelation 16. It's just not going to happen the way they think it is. Revelation 16 and verse 8. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. 
and men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which hath power over these plagues and they repented not to give him glory I, I, you know I smile really I, you know one should not one should not laugh at the sad future that unbelievers have got when they particularly the tribulation and are, are into hell fire but I, but I always remember because the churches for the most part you know when when the, when Christians are raptured the churches will go on pretty much as normal most of them you know most of the Anglican churches will still be struggling along trying to raise money for the spire after we've gone as they are now you know the Methodists will carry on having their bingo nights and their judo clubs and all the rest of it it will all go on as though nothing happens except the real saints will be missing and I, and I always remember Herbert Ray saying once when, when, the, when the tribulation hits, he says, and I'm up in heaven, he says, I shall, he says, I shall be reading my newspaper, he says, because he says, I think they'll have John Chancellor up there, the same as every day there, and I shall put my most newspaper down, and I shall lean, lean over and say, it couldn't happen to a nicer bunch of guys. And of course, that's what the churches are these days, they want to be Mr. Nice Guy, don't they? Some Muslim fanatics are confident that Islam will soon dominate the planet. That every nation will soon submit to their God, Allah. Now if one considers the Muslim birth rate in Europe compared with the indigenous peoples, he would have to say that the Islamic fanatics might be right. But the Bible teaches that within around seven years of Antichrist rule, whether he be a Muslim or not, there are some that say this is the Imam Mahdi of the Muslims, the Saviour will come and grind that whole system to powder. So, you know, don't get too uptight. I've, I've known believers getting really uptight about the growth of Islam. If it is Islam, and if the Antichrist is the Imam Mahdi, the Lord's going to crush it anyway. And personally, I think I'll be in the glory. The churches generally these days, being obsessed with materialism and sensationalism, have no understanding of prophecy at all. And the whole scene, and we can't go there tonight, I'm just wondering whether we should do it next, next Wednesday. I don't know. I will pray about that. But the whole scene, the coming scene, is pictured in Exodus 32, which you might write, like to read at your leisure. We can't go there tonight. So then the third section is verses 13 down to 23. And Jacob addresses Esau again. So even after his prayer, it seems that his heart is still uneasy. And we all know all about that, don't we? You know, we get worried, we get troubled, we get exercised, you know, and we go to prayer and we pour our hearts out to the Lord and we finish praying and we still feel pretty anxious. And that's the way it is, I think, here with Jacob. And so we read about his centre present. If you add them up, there's about 580 creatures, camels and bulls and sheep and goats and so forth, to seek to pacify Esau before they finally meet. And he sends them out in droves to try and build up the the the, uh, the sense of kindness if you will his first address to Esau was without any gifts but now he's strengthening his appeal now he, he feels he's got to do more and we'll find he does exactly the same with the Lord when we come to his second uh, prayer second prayer Jacob's second address to Esau uh, raised some very interesting questions for me Usually what I do very often if I'm studying for, for a Wednesday message, I'll get all the commentaries out and uh, I'll read one and, and I'll read the passage, read the commentary, read the passage, read another commentary, read the passage, read another commentary, read them and so on and just pick out of the commentaries what, what I think will be helpful and what I find myself helpful. And I read about eight commentaries uh, on this passage and some of them, including John Phillips, who I think is a great commentator, take issue with Jacob for sending these gifts. They argue that he was not trusting God, but practicing a scheme of his own, and that this was the same old scheme in Jacob. And good commentators, I say, like John Phillips, hold that view, and others too. But then I found that other commentators, such as Andrew Fuller, and John Trapp, and Matthew Henry, commend Jacob for what he does here, um, saying, in effect, God helps those who help themselves, and we'll, we'll just think a little bit more about that in a moment. Book of Proverbs says, Then I saw it and considered it well. well. I looked upon it and received instruction. That's Proverbs 24, 32. And this is what struck me. A man's heart will colour his understanding of the word of God. We can all use the same Bible, but different people come up with different conclusions. Two men who are keen King James believers will read a passage and come to opposite 
conclusions, as these commentators did here. They were all using the KJV. And, uh, and I think the reason for that is our own hearts and our own characters will colour our understanding. Um, a man's own nature often interprets the scriptures. That's why lost men can never find God in the Bible. Because they're, you know, their natures are, they're blind by nature, so they can't find God in the Word. Now the first lesson to learn, I think, from this is that we must rely upon the Holy Spirit to teach us. And we must do that not only when we're first saved, we must do that as we proceed through our Christian lives. Again, I remember Herbert Rash saying, whenever I come to study the Bible, I put all my doctrine on the table, and if the Holy Spirit wants to knock it into a cocked hat in one verse, that's his business. And I've never forgotten that. Obviously, I've never forgotten that. I heard that 30 years ago. He's a man that was willing to be taught by the Holy Spirit, and we need to understand that we learn the truth by reading the Scriptures, but also by a prayerful dependence upon the Holy Spirit to teach us. So that's the first thing. We, we must rely upon the Holy Spirit. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lead not on thine understanding. Secondly, which of the commentators is right? Now as much as I appreciate John Phillips, I found Matthew Henry far more convincing. Now, if you want a commentary, if you don't have a lot of commentaries, and if you want a commentary, get Matthew Henry. Uh, he knew nothing about prophecy because prophecy was still sealed until the time of the end, as the Lord said to Daniel. But on everything else, he's arguably unequal. I remember hearing uh, Jack Mormon say once that the best commentator you can get is Matthew Henry, and there's, there's a lot of truth in that. It's arguable, perhaps, but an excellent commentator. And Matthew Henry said, commenting upon this situation, help thyself and God will help thee. I remember some months ago, you know, hearing somebody say God helps those who help themselves and, you know, thinking I'm not so sure about that, but I'm more inclined to think so, having studied this passage. John Trapp also agrees with Matthew Henry very convincingly. Trapp says, means must be used, but not trusted. Perhaps I can illustrate this, and the illustration comes from John Trapp as well. Does God want to teach you his word? Do we know from the Bible that God wants to teach us his word. Should we then read it or should we wait for miraculous inspiration? You see you have to do something. You know God wants to read, wants you to understand his word, but you therefore must do something about it. You must read it. Now in these days of instantaneous everything, the charismatic expects a dream or a vision instead of disciplining himself to search the scriptures. And I always remember, you know, uh, I hadn't been saved long. I was living in, it was before I was married, I was living in Boldmere, Sutton Coldfield, Sutton Coldfield Way, sharing a house with two fellas. And I, I don't know whether I was off work sick, I think I might have been on holiday. And I wanted, like so many new converts do, I didn't want to carry on an ordinary job. I wanted to do something world shaking for the Lord. And, uh, and I'd sent for some tapes from Operation Mobilisation, OM brother used to say it's called, it stands for old motors in fact I think it was George Verley who said it stood for old motors because everything they had was second hand um, but if you, you went, in those days this is 40 years ago you had to mean business with God if you wanted to go on AM because you had to pray for your food you had to pray for everything and those, those, those youngsters that were involved in AM and it was rather a kind of a young people movement and I guess it still is I think it's gone south somewhat now um, but you know, you had to mean business to go on AM, and I was wondering whether God wanted me to go, and I sent off a what they called orientation tapes, because it's such a shock to the system, you know, they wanted to kind of get you ready, and the preacher was George Verwer, and he was preaching a message on the Word of God, I don't know if I've told you this before, and it was so powerful, I think it was, it was one of the most powerful men, because in those days, that guy used to preach like there's no tomorrow, and it was so powerful. Uh, and so powerful was it, in fact, that when I'd listened to this hour's ministry, I went upstairs, I got all the tracts I've got, I filled a bag up with them, several hundred, and I went into town, got a strut on the bus, went into town, and just gave them all out. I remember going into the, the Midland Red bus station, I think it was the Midland Red bus station back in those days, and all the, the bus stands got long queues on them, and I got this big bag of tracts, I went all down all the queues at the bus stands, and all the buses went down, and there wasn't a single tract on the floor. I must have given about 300 tracts out in the space of 15 minutes, there wasn't one on the floor. But that's a digression. You know, I was encouraged then to understand the importance of studying and reading the Word of God. 
Trap says again, he that would have knowledge must not only beg for it, that's prayer, but dig for it, that's read and study. He that would have knowledge, says Trap, must not only beg for it, but dig for it, saith Solomon, out of his own experience. And uh, I'll just read that to you, Solomon's experience. It's Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. Verse 3. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. You see, God is not in the instant blessing business. Everything these days has to be instant, doesn't it? Um, you know, we send an email and we expect a reply in an hour, or maybe less, I don't know, you know. And everything's got to be done like this. God doesn't work that way. God is not going to fall for this instant business that we're all so keen on. Sanctification takes time. Growing in the Lord takes time, and it takes work, and it takes effort on our part. Yes, God will keep helping us. God will keep encouraging us. God will bless us, but we have to make some effort. We at least have to read the scriptures. And I would think at least we have to pray too. Finally, the last part of the chapter is verses 24 through 32. And we read there that Jacob addresses the Lord again. And it's, it's, he's wrestling here. Now it is literally wrestling, I believe. It is corporal, as they say, or corporeal. It is physical contact, but yet it is also prayer. It speaks of prayer and it is prayer. But it's undeniable, I think, because it says he touched the joint uh, and put Jacob's leg out of the joint. So it's corporeal, but it is also spiritual. And this wrestling in prayer speaks of the kind of prayer that I doubt more than one, th one in a thousand Christians knows anything about these days. Anyone who prays like this in a modern prayer meeting would be thought eccentric by the rest of the church. And I've, you know, I've known cases where a brother has poured his heart out in their prayer, prayer meeting. They haven't quite snickered, but you wonder if they thought he was bonkers or whether he was going to come again. You know, and I've had it, I've had it myself. Jacob's second address to Esau, Esau was stronger than the first, and his second address to the Lord is also far stronger than the first. His first prayer was good, it was acceptable. But this is the kind of praying that James writes about. If you look at James' epistle, talking about the wrestling now, James' epistle, chapter 5. And verse 17. Elias, that's Elisha. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly, earnestly, that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. I have a note in the margin from Joseph Hall. If our prayers want success, they want heart. Their blessing is according to their vigour. When I read John Trapp's commentary, and he's absolutely golden at this place, when I read John Trapp's commentary on Jacob's wrestling with God, I have to say I was so ashamed of myself that I had to stop studying and go and confess my sin to the Lord. I'm going to quote a little of it. Uh, it concerns Hugh Latimer. This particular comment in, in John Trapp on this wrestling has to do with Hugh Latimer, who was a bishop of Worcester, an Anglican bishop, smock and all, uh, in the 16th century, who was burned at the stake in Oxford by Bloody Mary in 1555. Trapp says, quote, Latimer so plied the throne of grace with his once again, once again restore the gospel to England that he would have no nay at God's hands. He many times continued kneeling and knocking so long together that he was not able to rise without help. His knees were grown hard like camel's knees as Eusebius reports of James, the Lord's brother, unquote. I, we used to have a guy come to us years ago who had been a Bible teacher and he was a historian. I think he used to teach uh, Christian history as well. And he told us about Latimer and he said that when Latimer preached in the streets of London, 
he would have an hourglass. He would they'd have a big pulpit out on the street. He would have an hourglass. And when the hour was up, the people used to shout, Turn the glass, Master Latimer! <laughs> Times have changed, haven't they? He'd preach for an hour, and the folks in the street, the crowds would say, Turn the glass, Master Latimer. And he wasn't the only one. There were others in his day that were just the same. Show me a man who can pray well like Latimer, and I'll show you a man who can preach well. If a man claims he can preach, I can tell whether he can preach or not when I've heard him pray. Now, as I say, this was literally a physical wrestling with Jacob and Jacob called the place Peniel which means if you have a margin I don't think you do in, in the church Bibles it means the face of God I have seen what does he say um, verse 30 Jacob called the, na the name of the place Peniel for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved most probably this was a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus um, I'm just trying to think of the theological term they give for it now it's not an epiphany uh, Christophany, that's right a, a pre-incarnation appear of the Lord Jesus and I would say and, and one of the commentators says this and I think it's true and it's the kind of thing that Ian Bounds the great prayer would say Esau was disarmed here it was here that Esau was disarmed before ever he got near before ever Jacob and Esau met it was this praying that took all the, all the hostility out of Esau I'm sure it was well, there's no mention of Esau in the prayer of course but surely it was about him it was this fear that drove uh, Jacob to his knees in the night and the promise given to Jacob typifies the privilege of those who learn to pray in verse um, 28 thy name shall be called no more Jacob but Israel but as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed if you want encouraging in prayer read E.M. Bounds I know I've said this before I've got some E.M. Bounds downstairs he was a man who prayed and prayed and prayed he wrote his books I believe on his knees and he will encourage your prayer life as a prince hast thou power with God and with men the Lord said to Jacob so how's your prayer life let's close on that note shall we how's your prayer life brethren do we know what it is to wrestle? I confess, as I say, I was ashamed of myself when I, and, and, and it used to happen a lot more than it does now, um, when I read passages like when I read this passage and these comments from John Trapp today. The prayer meeting is important. I wish to God some Christians would get a hold of this. The prayer meeting is important. They whine and they moan about the, what, what the government is doing, but they won't come and meet with the saints and pray. I understand, they'll perfectly understand that not everybody can do it. You know, folks have got to work sometimes. Uh, you know, the car breaks down. I understand that, but the car doesn't break down every week. I know some folks have to work every week, but the car doesn't break down every week. And some folks will not come to the prayer meeting. And it's a sad, it's a sad state of affairs. How's your prayer life? We're going to turn to prayer. I just want to mention a couple of things.